Hey game makers! Welcome to another Tips and Tricks! Today we'll be looking at just five tips and tricks, but these are some things I find that are particularly important to talk about. This is just one of a whole mini series of videos at this point, so make sure to take a look at the rest if this at all piques your interest. Now start! To use MB's Dark Theme, make sure you're updated to version 1.2 or higher, go to Tools, Options, and under UI, 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 that, you can change the program's color scheme between several different options. Now you know. MB doesn't have spellcheck and that's kind of a pain in the butt. But I understand why, because it would be a huge pain for the, you know, multi-language programming and the fact that we all use very strange words and names in our games. So I find it really helpful to write out important scenes in an exterior program, in my case Microsoft Office. Anything that has spell check is probably fine, but I'd avoid something like Notepad that doesn't. This way you can write them, spell check them, and then just add in all the text. This is actually really convenient, as you don't have to worry about the extra gamey guff or, you know, writing the scene while you're writing the scene, i.e. move all the events! It helps to make notes as you go for anything specific you want to happen, like character 1 runs up and jumps on character 2, kind of thing. Fun note, if you go into your game's data folder, you can open up the JSON files and edit your game's data manually. I use a program called PSPAD to open these. It writes out the events, their commands, and database info, and so on and so forth. I wouldn't advise doing this if you can't understand what you're looking at, but I find this very helpful specifically for mass spelling fixes. Like, for example, when you accidentally spell dimension wrong your entire game. <laughs> Just open up the maps, find replace the word, and fun. Indicators. What I'm referring to here is the visual or auditory cues that let the player know something. This can be anything from using face graphics or name tags, to playing the same sound effect when getting certain items, or having distinctive sound effects played depending on which character is talking. Something just to let the player know, like having a different and distinctive sound effect play when given a normal item compared to a key item. Or having some sort of visual cue, like having the message box opening, or balloon tails pointing to the character whenever a new character starts talking. This will both keep the player's attention, and more importantly, keep them aware of what's going on during scenes. Without any sort of visual or audio cues, it's a lot more likely the player will, say, miss that they got an item from someone, or have a harder time telling which character is talking. It's why games like Pokemon and Zelda have the You Got to Items mini cutscenes and iconic sound effects play. It's especially helpful for those who have things like sight or hearing problems, as they'd be able to easily recognize the Got the Item pose, and you'd be able to hear the sound if you happen to skip past all the You Got the Item text. A lot of games tend to use different types of indicators, so all is a few I've come across. Having a sound effect play after each window of text, Keep in mind, you wouldn't want to use anything that sounds overly obnoxious. Just a small little sound you probably will barely notice. Only have the character's name show up, flash, or what have you, whenever a new character starts talking. This is a good way of letting the player easily tell who's talking. You can use Yonfly's Message Core plugin to show name tag windows, or use this code on the screen to show all that line's text, so the name stays in the message window kind of thing. Have the message window play its opening animation whenever a new character starts talking. I'm actually using this method in my current project. Ideally, I'd also like to be able to use message balloon tails, but I digress. In my project, I throw the message window around the screen a whole lot, to make sure that all the important characters are clearly visible during the scene, and so that the windows are nearby the characters. I found it hard to keep track of, so I put in wait commands between each of the characters' groups of dialogue to force the message window to reopen. That way, you get a distinguishable animation that shows where the new window is, so the player can move their eyes there naturally, instead of trying to find where the static window went. Play a repeated sound effect when each character talks. Again, Yonfly's message extension plugin allows for this. For the best results, you would probably want to play a separate sound effect for each character, with varying types of sounds, pitches depending on the character, and heck, even speed if your character happens to talk super fast or super slow. <laughs> This will give the layer an idea of how the character is supposed to sound, without needing to go on full crazy voice acting. Now, those are just a few suggestions. There are many others, so I'd take a look at some games you particularly like, and see what kind of things they did for the player. Ah, screen resolution! Can you, 
Can you hear how much I want to talk about this one? For those of you who don't know, MV's default screen resolution is 816 by 624 This can be changed with Yonfly's core engine. Jeez, I'm mentioning Yonfly a lot today. <laughs> or a standalone resolution plugin. Fun side note, you know how when you change the resolution and play your game and it still starts as the default resolution then extends? When you deploy your game, you can actually go into the package.json file. Here, you can change the width and height to the ones you actually have your game set to. And you can change a few other things here too. This means when you run your deployed game's exe file, it'll start at the correct resolution instead of transforming into it! Okay, back to the point. Many people see that you can change the resolution and go, Oh, awesome, I'm gonna make my game 1920 by 1080 it's gonna be amazing, and okay, stop right there. <laughs> you want to make your game screen size work for your game, not against it. Trust me, your players want that too. And these resources, both graphics and plugins, aren't primarily designed for largest resolutions like If you just scale up your game screen without touching anything else, you get a lot of tiny sprites with too much screen on the screen, and a lot of empty space in menus. Not to mention, MB tends to have some lag issues at high resolution. Now, if you are planning on using super high res maze graphics, making your maps mega detailed and massive, and customizing your menus to work with that kind of screen size, then yes, you probably, no, most definitely, should use a super high resolution. But if you just want to go for, say, the widescreen look, you can just change the width a little and it'll be fine. There will be a link in the description to a sort of resolution calculator that I find kind of helpful. Let's talk layout. If you're making a high-res, massive, big widescreen game, you probably want to keep all the important stuff where the player is going to look for it. This also applies to box screen games too, but it's less of a worry as there's not as many places to look. This is also an advantage handheld games seem to have. As you're generally looking at the entire screen all the time, there are less spots where you can easily miss things. Handheld games are also a lot bigger than they seem. Let's take this 3DS game. Its font looks pretty small, all things considered, but when you blow it up to, say, your computer's screen size, the font is actually kinda huge. Beyond just adjusting your images and font sizes to match your screen size, I want to talk about message windows in specific. For a widescreen game, I'd avoid having the message window the exact full width of the screen. Think about this. You'd have a line of text saying, "Ah!" take up three letters in that massive space. Or perhaps you have a novel's worth of dialogue in that one message box. If the player is playing the game in front of, say, a computer screen, they're likely sitting relatively near to it. They'd have to turn their head to follow the text, or just be way too much text to read all at once. This can be avoided and or helped by either making the font bigger or the message window itself smaller. Again, this is something phone games and handhelds can probably get away with, because you're usually looking at the entire screen. This is our last tip for today, and I wanted to make it an important one. Don't feel obligated to make your game like somebody else's. Don't feel like you absolutely have to make a game that's new and fresh and different. Just make the game that you can make, and most importantly, what you want to make. I've seen a lot of people say this to me, and honestly, I feel like this sometimes too. It makes me depressed that I can never make a game that good. I shouldn't even try. I do this too. I see other people making games and think, gee, I wish I had thought of that, or oh gee, I wish I was the one who made such an amazing game. But then you have to stop and think, what do I think? Those games are awesome. But they aren't me. They aren't actually the game I want to create. What I'm trying to say here is that your games, your feelings, and your ideas are exclusive to you. No one will ever, ever make your game. And no one will ever make your game your way. That's up to you. If you aren't quite there yet, there's only one thing to do. Learn, get better, try, and don't give up. I've talked about this several times in the past, but getting good at something, anything, starts with you. Trust me, this, this right here, this was my first attempt at a game. Yep, uh, real pro there. What, with that, uh, big open room with, uh, lots of beds and, uh, oh, who am I kidding? The walls aren't even even! <laughs> this is about 13 years old. I was 9 or 10 when I made this. Thirteen years of off-and-on storytelling, research, game-making, and drawing later, I can make stuff like this now. And this, this isn't perfect, not by a long shot. 
But you know what? If I keep practicing, learning, and trying to do better, if you keep practicing, learning, and trying to do better, for all we know, we'll be releasing the next big game hit, or working on the next huge epic project, or becoming a YouTuber that does videos on a fun little program about making games. That's not something that can happen if you give up. And that's all for today, though. Be sure to check out my Patreon page if you're at all interested in supporting these videos or my game projects. Make sure to let me know if there's anything you'd like to see here. And thank you for watching. Until next time, I'll see you later, gamers! Thank you.